Welcome to the Lionheart Podcast. I'm Jenny Madison, and today I'm speaking with my special guest, Rowena Jane. Rowena has grabbed my attention because of her vibrancy, joy, exuberance, and her extraordinary ability to get her body into some incredibly flexible postures within the Yoga Asana series. We discuss how this kind of flexibility is really about emotional release and inner freedom. We go into the true meaning of yoga, the mind-body connection, unity, and ultimately self-realization. That is the freeing of self-imposed blockages and limitations within the body and the unconscious mind. Rowena is the author of The Joy of Real Food. She is a real food yogi and is also currently working on her own meditation series, which includes wisdom from the numerous modalities of which she has been trained. You'll love the meditation tips and the very many lifestyle tips for well-being that Rowena shares in this episode. There's something that you said in your book, The Joy of Real Food, and you said that yoga is quite misunderstood. Can we start with that? Could you share a little bit about what you're referring to there? I have a feeling that will also lead into your personal transformation and your journey with yoga. Well, I guess especially during in the West, yoga is very much seen as a physical practice. And yes, it is a physical practice because you're using your body, but it goes beyond just this physical stretching. I mean, the biggest thing people say when I say I do yoga, oh, I'm not flexible. Now, it doesn't even have anything to do with flexibility. You know, yoga is, yes, you're using strength and flexibility in a physical posture, but really you're using yoga as a means to engage your mind. So yes, you're doing certain postures and they're going to stimulate organs and they're going to help in eliminate waste products and there's certain postures that will they'll all help to get circulation through the body. So they're wonderful tools in themselves like that. But really the underlying aspect of doing yoga is to connect the body and connect the mind together in union. And you're also when you're doing the postures, there's things that are going to come up. And so you're going to have to use qualities of your mind. You're going to have to use determination and concentration and willpower and faith. And so we're working on this whole array of qualities of the mind in order to bring forth what we call self-realization. And so, you know, a self-realized person isn't going to live their life in doubt. A self-realized person isn't going to get freaked out anytime something happens in their life because they're going to be full of faith within themselves. Mm. So one of the underlying things, and as you know, I teach Bikram yoga, the hot Mm. yoga, which is a challenging yoga style. And I know you also practice it now. Mm. And in those challenges, you're forced to stop and to breathe and to find a way through those challenges. And so you start strengthening your mind. And in that, you start to believe in yourself. Your confidence increases. And so this whole change starts to take place inside of you. And then if we're looking at the understanding that yoga is actually a somatic body therapy, so somatic means of the body. So they're understanding that yoga is psychosomatic. So in other words, And this is where I guess if we talk about anything else around neuroemotions, we hold emotions in our body. Mm. You know, emotions are an everyday part of our life, of course. But what happens sometimes is the stress response will go off when emotion comes up. And if something doesn't work correctly and we're not able to let that emotion go, then that is hardwired in our body somewhere. And so by doing yoga and stimulating a certain area or a certain joint or a certain muscle or whatever we're doing, we actually start to stimulate that underlying emotion. And so often through practice, people will come in and they'll do a pose and they'll say, why was I crying? Or why did I feel angry? And it doesn't really matter why or what's actually going on. It's the fact that it's coming up to the surface in order to be released from the body. And so through breath, of course, and through stillness, you're able to observe and become a witness to all of these things that show up in your practice. And then in that, so much healing takes place. Mm. When you speak about the emotions that surface, these are really coming from a deep, deep unconscious part of our psyche, aren't they? 
Exactly. Very much unconscious. So we have our conscious thoughts and they are ruled by our prefrontal cortex, the neocortex of the brain. But when we're looking at emotions, that's all related to our limbic system and that is very unconscious stuff. I guess the analogy that often gets used is the the iceberg, <laughs> you know, the iceberg we can see, mm-hmm. but it's what's beneath the surface. It's what's beneath that water. That's our unconscious stuff. And that's the stuff that's really hardwired. Even as a practitioner, or even as a, as a yoga teacher, when students talk to you or when clients will come and see me, they'll often have a pre idea, pre concept of what's causing their problems or their issue in their life. And through the work that we do, it's often got nothing to do with what that consciousness is Mm -hmm. telling them. Mm -hmm. And it might play a role, yes, but there's usually a lot deeper stuff going on beneath the surface. And that's what I was just thinking about where yoga has been misunderstood. Basically, what you're saying is it works way, way deeper than the physical postures and the physical asanas, the physical body, and that the body is holding onto these depths of beingness really and ultimately when we work through those layers now this gets exciting (laughs) it does get exciting i love it so much we tap into the the what you said here was this self-realized so the state of being that is kind of detached or separate in some ways from all this unconscious consciousness Mm -hmm. (laughs) so yeah yeah so that's what you mean when you say about yoga being misunderstood However, in saying that, with awareness or not awareness, I'm sure those that are practicing yoga, whether they realize it or not, it's doing the work or not, or yes? I agree. I do agree. It's, 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 it's an interesting thing. I think when people first start out, we all have our preconceived ideas of what it is. And we often say to our students, you know, you've got no idea what you're doing in here. You've got no idea what is really taking shape and form. And at the end of the class, people feel good. Something's Mm. changed inside of them. And first, yeah, it's very often physical for people when they first come. Like they might have heard, oh, if I do yoga, I'll lose weight or I'll, Mm. you know, reduce my stress levels. And, yes, that's a kind of surface level. But the more you practice, the more these things just start to happen. And it's interesting when you have chats with people, we all start to get similar awarenesses because we've got this whole cosmic consciousness, which we're all tapping Mm. into really. Mm. So people start having similar insights and similar understandings, which is quite profound. Like so many times as a beginning teacher, and I was always reading and learning, but I remember so many times I'd pick up other books, like I'd pick up Bikram's book or I'd pick up even Iyengar's books and, and I'd be reading things thinking, oh my gosh, this is the stuff that I just innately start talking about with my students because we're tapping into this really powerful source and understanding, you know, we're connecting deeper, we're raising our energy levels, we're raising our vibration Dr. Joe Dispenza. Yes, yes. I think he does an amazing job of really explaining. I mean, he's talking more about meditation, but it's so similar. Mm. He's talked so much about the energy rising and coming up through the thalamic gates and then expanding outwards. And this is really what's going on. And this is why it becomes such an expansive practice. You know, we expand, we open up Mm. our perception changes, you know, this narrow minded idea of what life really is begins to change. And we start seeing things in different light and we're repatterning and reconditioning. And I mean, it's just so powerful. I could just go on all day. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yoga and meditation truly are two peas in a pod. Yeah. So the powers of both. And there was something I just want to touch on you for a moment. (laughs) You are a Bikram yoga teacher. Yes, I I know that. Was it always Bikram or did you start with another yoga and how did it start the whole yoga journey? It's interesting you asked me that because no one's ever asked me, is it only Bikram? Actually, I was in the performing arts industry Mm. and my first experience of yoga was during our performing arts degree, every Friday we used to have to do yoga and I absolutely hated it. It was my worst subject of the entire course and I used to dread it. I found it so boring. But also I had come from a lot of trauma in my early childhood and so I'm, I'm understanding this now in, in hindsight, yes, I know this, but at the time I had no idea and I was really stiff. I mean, I was also a runner, so that doesn't help you know, I used to compete in running. So I hated it also because my body would hurt so much. 
I was so stiff as a dancer. I was one of the most stiff dancers because I just wasn't very flexible at all, at all. (laughs) My leg would go to 90 degrees and everyone else would be kicking their leg up to the ceiling, for example, you know, in dance class. So I guess that's one of the reasons why I didn't like it. And understanding now, obviously, because the emotions hold you and create more tension in the body. And as you start releasing emotion, then your body starts opening and expanding as well. But yeah, so that was my first experience of yoga and I didn't like it at all. And if someone had said to me, you are going to end up being a yoga teacher, there is no way I would ever have believed them. So my next initiation into yoga was Bikram yoga. And so I had been in the performing arts industry working and I'd been in that industry for about 10 years and I'd gone back and done more studies in acting. I was just about to graduate and I had been suffering a lot from lots of various different things. My birth father had been threatening to kill me. And so I went into just massive fear and panic and I gosh, it was just a hell period. I developed sciatica and I also developed rheumatoid arthritis. It's all the stress. And I was emotionally eating and binge eating as well, just to try to cope. And that had been a pattern for me for a very long time that I hadn't dealt with and I hadn't even really admitted. And so then I sort of started to get better from the arthritis. That's when I found neuroemotional technique and started working with that. And then my colon began bleeding. And I was hospitalized and it was like a wake up call. I was sitting in the hospital and they were saying to me, we think you've got Crohn's disease. And all I could hear in my head was this voice saying, no, you don't. This is your wake up call. This is your chance to change your life. You can take a new trajectory of your life. And, you know, for the first time, that voice felt like hope. All the other voices in my head had been always negative. And this felt like this voice of hope and faith and truth and trust. And so I just listened to it. And I just started putting waves out to the universe. Okay, tell me if if I need to change my life, what do I need to do? And then I was literally hobbling down the street because I still had arthritis and I could barely walk. And I was hobbling down the street and somebody called my name. And I was looking around and there was no one there (laughs) thinking, okay. And then I heard, look up. And so I was like, what? Look up. So I just looked up and there was this building and it had a big sign on it and it said Bikram Yoga Lane Cove Grand Opening. And I don't know what it was, but it was like, yes, that's it. That's my sign. And so I went home, got my credit card, got a yoga mat and um, I had one of those spongy yoga mats that beginners often turn up with. So I didn't even have the right kind of mat. Oh my gosh. And I turned up and something changed. I could barely do the postures, you know, I had my Mm. swollen knee and yet here I was feeling this energy. I just remember the energy that I was feeling and I just felt alive more than I had in a very long time. I felt positive. I was so Mm. excited. I went home and all I wanted to eat was healthy food. I didn't want to eat junk food, which is what I'd been addicted to, you know, with my eating disorder, binging and starving and binging and starving. Mm. And so that first class elicited so much change and I just kept going back and back and back and just, it went from there. And I have studied yin yoga and I have studied Shivananda, Mm -hmm. but I always, Bikram's the bomb for me. It's my lifeline. (laughs) Yes, I can relate. I'm a Bikram yoga lover too. I'm not a teacher. I'm a very, very happy student and I feel all those. I do it because I feel amazing when I do. It's that simple. And also I do it because I actually feel so strong and sturdy in my body. I can actually sit in meditation a lot longer now and be comfortable as well as many other things. There is something I must say. When you shared that you were stiff, I'm kind of like, I find that so hard to believe (laughs) because I have to say this and I'm going to ask our listeners, please go to Rowena Jane's Instagram page and have a look at some of the photos and videos. I watched something that you were doing the other day and I was just going, I could not get my mind around how your body could do that. I'm like, really? And I watched it again. I go, (laughs) it's amazing. So to actually... And have you say that you were once stiff is kind of, and I think the tables have reversed. You at the time said, I don't believe I'll be doing yoga. And now at the time I'm saying, I don't believe you've never done yoga or that you, <laughs> you couldn't or have you had that sort of stiffness that you describe. It is amazing what you do with your, just the, the movements, the way you can just, it's like everything is just, just 
it's so gracious as well. It's literally, oh, wow, like, wow. And so you went into that where as you released emotion, something happens in your body. So that's amazing really to think about. You, like the physical change that occurs when we release our emotional trauma or what's stuck. Now this yeah. may go into a little bit more of the net technique, neuroemotional. Is that something that yeah. you discovered to complement? Yeah. I mean, you've worked so deeply. It's, it's manifested physically. Amazing. Sure. Yeah, correct. Correct. And that's what I, it's funny because I wrote a post on Facebook. I just felt inspired to write this post a couple of months ago about that because as a now flexible yogi, mm. there's a lot of judgment and there's a lot of judgment on, oh, they're flexible. It's just natural for them. Oh, it's so easy for you. And I think, my gosh, you have no idea my journey. Mm. Everything is conditioning. And that was my biggest discovery during my teacher training. And I talked about that in my book was that I was in the middle of camel pose, which is a, a deep backward bending posture. And I just started bawling my eyes out. And this insight was coming up that, well, if my own birth father doesn't love me, then no one's going to love me. Who else is going to love me? And I was crying the whole rest of the class. And I was even crying after the class. And then the teacher trainer, head of training came up and I did this whole big roar like a lion to help me just get rid of that emotion from the body. And then the same thing happened with my sciatica. I was in a posture in the separate leg stretching posture and I pulled my foot back to stretch and that sciatic nerve just started burning and I was in pain and I was crying and crying and crying. And then the next day in that teacher training, I woke up and I never had sciatica and I haven't had it ever again. And so I started to get this really deep understanding of the somatics and Bikram's wife registry is an MD and talks a lot. Her passion is also the psychosomatic side of yoga. And so the more I spoke with her and talk to her and listen to her speak, the more I realized, yeah, this is the insights that I'm having. And so the more I did the yoga and the more I allowed my emotions to come up because you can still practice and the moment something comes up, which is a normal human thing to do, the moment we start to feel emotion, what do we do? We suppress it. Mm. You know, and that's one of the things I learned during my acting degree. As actors, you don't just go on and show big emotion of anger. We as human beings are constantly pushing it down and pushing it down. So a sign of a really good actor is actually someone you can see them suppressing it and trying to suppress it and trying to suppress it. And that's why an actor becomes so believable. It's because they're suppressing them. They're really working on that suppression of emotion. And so when we're suppressing all these emotions and then we start allowing ourselves to feel. And so yoga is a place where and any healing really is a place where we're really required to trust and we're really required to be vulnerable. And I think as a modern world, particularly, we're taught don't be vulnerable because it feels like it's unsafe to be vulnerable. You know, it's safer to not show that anger. It's safer to not, especially if you're a man and you're crying, oh, my gosh, that's not good. You can't show that. And so we are used to suppressing. And the understanding, too, is that emotions are often seen as psychological. Mm. But actually, and this is where NET comes into it, NET has the basis that emotions are physiologically based and that's scientifically shown. Mm. If you actually break it down, emotions are based on minute proteins in the body called information substances. Mm. And they're comprised of neuropeptides, so, so neuro means the brain, and then hormones and other specialised information molecules that permeate the entire body, so including our DNA. And this, if you want to look into more of that work, Dr. Candice Pert, her work, her book, Molecules of Emotion, speaks about that a lot more. And so actually, and that's scientifically based, that emotions are actually physiologically sound and not psychologically. I'm not saying that you can't have psychological stuff going on, but it's physiology. So if we're looking at physiology, then we've got this amazing power now to work with our physiology to release these emotions from the body. And so it's, you mentioned with yoga previously the union of body and mind, that they're, they're in union, that that is a reality. It's not something we discover. It's there. It's just that we, yeah. may, we may be disconnected and yoga helps That's us. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yoga so, helps us to reconnect on so that. Even though the emotions are physiological and in the body, they're still connected to thought, yeah? Of course, yes, yes. But that thought is the conditioning. 
everything is conditioning and that's the Pavlovian uh, research. So everything is conditioning. So you look back in time. Okay. So here's an example. You know, you've got a child that's playing in a room and a white cat enters the room and then all of a sudden there's a really loud noise, bang. And so that child is going to associate because everything's around association. So that mm-hmm. child is now going to associate that white cat with that loud noise, right? If it happens over and over again, mm-hmm. so every time that white cat comes in, there's a small association there mm. that says, oh, noise, and they'll have a fear towards this cat, mm. right? This is how it can stem to later on 15 years down the track. Yes. All of a sudden it's like I've got a massive phobia of cats, yes. white cats, yet it might have just been that one incident and somehow it's been re-embedded and re-embedded and re-embedded. And this is what happens with patterning. Yes. The phobia is not the white cat. The phobia is the story that the mind creates exactly. around the white exactly. cat. And that exactly. stays there for it. Well, not forever, but it stays there to adulthood. <laughs> mm. Exactly. And that's why we call stuff emotional reality. So in NET, we don't, it's not that we don't believe you when you come in with a story, mm-hmm. but there is proof that about 7% or 10% of what we actually say in our stories is only is true. The rest of it we've made up. <laughs> is reality. Because it's emotional yeah. reality. So, yeah, it's all association and, re- and re- emotional reality. reality. You're right. And this is why it's important to look at the subconscious stuff. So what do you do? What do you do in it? Give me an idea of what a session might look like. Okay. You know, like okay. how do you get to these stories? And yeah, how- I know, crazy, right? Yeah. So, so we're using different principles. So we're using eight dynamics really to understand NET firstly. So we've got that emotionally, emotions are physiological base. We've got the Pavlovian response, the understanding there's conditioning. Then we've got the meridian system. So we tap into Chinese medicine and that it's a 4,000 year old principle And most people know now about acupuncture. And so there's a five element law which links the specific meridians in the body. And in in yoga, you know, we've got the shrotas and the nadis. So we're all talking about the same thing. Energy. It's basically the energy lines that move through the body. And the Western medical system doesn't even look at this. So basically, for example, in Chinese medicine, and Ayurveda is similar, but Chinese took it further. Mm -hmm. So there's an organ system and theory. So you've got different organs relating to different emotions. And so, for example, earth, the element of earth is relating to our stomach, spleen and pancreas emotions. So we've got emotions of low self-esteem. We've got emotions of distrust. We've got emotions of over-sympathetic. We've got a whole bunch of different emotions. Anger, for example, comes under liver or gallbladder. So basically we're looking at that system and we're looking at, okay, well, where's the emotion stored in the body? Mm. What is the actual emotion? And so that gives us a cue as to where we need to heal. So how we're going to correct the problem. So we're using a meridian line and then a breath technique and then the pulses of the Chinese pulses or a chiropractor will use activators in the nervous system in the spine. So basically the process, so that's using muscle testing in order to find out how to, what's actually going on with the body. So for example, Jenny, you might come to see me And you might have a problem now. It might be physical Mm -hmm. or it might be emotional or mental or whatever might be going on in your life. So, you know, for example, say you've had a fight with your partner and you're really upset. So we might just say, I don't know, just to say his name's John for for sake of. Okay. (laughs) So, So I might say to you, all right, say to me, Jenny, I'm okay with John. Mm-hmm. And when you say that, I'm going to muscle test. Mm-hmm. Now, a muscle test is going to show us where there's weakness in the body. Mm-hmm. So the body doesn't lie to us. So if you're strong and congruent with being okay with John, your arm is going to stay strong and it's not going to drop. Whereas if you're not okay, there's something going on that you need to work through and you've got a neuroemotional complex around John mm-hmm. and that's the physiology that I talked about before, then your arm is going to drop. And so that tells us, yeah, okay, we've got to dig some more. We're on track. So then what I'm going to do is either do a body mapping and I'm going to map all of the organs of the body or otherwise I can use pulse mappings, which is what the Chinese will touch, you know, when they're doing meridian checks to see what's going on in your body. Mm -hmm. So again, then we're going to muscle test, but we're going to muscle test then the organ, find out what organ it is. Then from there, we're going to find out what emotion it is. So then I'll say to you, okay, we are coming up with resentment How do you put John and resentment together in a sentence that makes sense to you? 
And then you're going to come up with your own little story. Mm. And then we're going to look for something deeper because as we know with white cat, remember we said white cat isn't the issue. Mm. It was the association. So if we dig deeper and say, okay, well, why does it bother you? Why does it bother you? Whatever you've told me. Mm. And then tell me that. And then we'll go back in time. So for example, say there's a child and says, oh, my dog died. I'm really sad. Now you might think, oh, the issue is because a dog died, she's sad. Okay, so why does that bother you? Why does that upset you? Mm-hmm. And the child will say, because now I've got no one, now I'm alone. So that's the issue. Yeah. So John's not the issue, huh? <laughs> no, no, it's your neuro. That's the irony of this thing. It makes you accountable. <laughs> so right, the more yeah. you do this healing work, the more you realise pointing the finger is not going to work yeah. because it's always our neuro-emotional complex. Yeah. So everything's around us. So we get triggered by somebody else because of our emotional complex because, okay, so example that story, I'm alone. So someone might do something that makes us feel alone. So we're like, and we want to attack that person. We want to get irate or angry or sad or whatever it is at that other person. But actually it's the emotional stuff that we've been carrying. It's our own baggage that creates a trigger. And so imagine the whole world, if we all start working on ourselves, we would have such better communication, connection, relationships. Oh my goodness. So, yeah, to go back and correct the issue. So then we've discovered what the issue is. So we'll go back in time and let's find out an original event. So then we'll muscle test, okay, conception to 10, 10 to 20. Oh, 10 to 20, okay, 10, 11, 12. Okay, then I'll say to you, Jenny, what happened at 12? And you know what? A memory will just come. Mm. It's amazing. And if you don't have trouble, if you have trouble, then we, we do helps. Like, is it related to family, friends, work, school, etc.? So we keep muscle testing until we find it if you're stuck. But most times, and the more you do this work, the better you get at it, you know, like anything, you start rewiring your brain to think like this, to work like this. And so, bang, these emotions come up, these memories come up, and all of a sudden you might be bawling your eyes out on the table and then we'll use the correcting point. So... For example, if it was stomach, then we're going to use the earth point on the hand and then we're going to place our hands on our forehead. On our forehead, we have neuro-emotional vascular points. So when we hold our hand there, it helps us reduce stress. When we're holding that point that's now going to make us strong Mm. because that's the point that relates to the emotion and then we focus on the situation that happened. And you might cry, you might be angry, whatever you might feel. And often sometimes people will get visions and the whole Mm. scenario will play out in front of your eyes. We call it the picture. Mm. And you'll be breathing now, breathing in and breathing out while you're experiencing that situation that took place. And the chiropractors will be clicking down the back, not holding the meridian point, but it's the same process. You'll be breathing. So you're holding the point on the forehead to release stress. You're also holding the, the correcting point of the relating to the organ and the emotion. So that's helping to clear that energy that's blocked. So basically it's helping to unclear, move the energy through and you're breathing. Mm. What do we know? And this goes back to yoga, breath, mm-hmm. breath. And there's so much more work coming out and information coming out now about breath work. I'm seeing more and more people starting to focus on breath. Mm-hmm. Breath is fantastic. There's an incredible book. I think it's called The Psychology of Yoga. And amazing book. And they talk so much about the control of the breath. And that's what the yogis breathe, I believe. When we learn to control our breathing, we learn to control our mind. And so you're breathing through the emotion instead of experiencing. So the stress response just dissipates. So basically it goes back to the way the stress response is meant to work. You know, we are meant to have stress. Stress is good. Stress tells us a danger. Stress warns us. But it's not meant to be held on to. It's meant to be let go of. And, you know, yoga is all about that too. This is where I see this cross correlation of what I do mm. because it's about that detachment. Yoga is so much about detachment, not holding on. And, you know, thoughts are going to come. You spoke about thoughts earlier. Thoughts are going to come and go constantly. That's the meandering of our mind. That mm. is normal. Mm. It's not about trying to stop the thoughts. It's about not attaching to the thoughts because the moment we attach, what happens? We're stuck in time. We're not flowing. We're not there. We're here. We're stuck in the past. Mm. And that's what creates, you know, all our emotional fear and stress and worries and depression and all that sort of stuff. I'm not saying that that's the be all and end all. That's the only thing. But mm. you know, th- that's where the breath is so powerful. Because mm-hmm. look what happens when you're angry. <gasps> you, you hold. You're not even breathing. Your face goes red. Or when you get a surprise on the phone, <gasps> 
Mm -hmm. you stop breathing, you know. And so that's what happens is we store that emotion bang at the time in the body. So it sounds so simple, but it's, it's really powerful. It's really powerful, but in a way it is so simple. Well, that's it. The, the pay, great things of, in life are simple, right? Yeah, it's just, just more. Because to breathe is autonomic. It's natural. It's, we all do it. There's not one exactly. living being on the planet yeah. that doesn't yeah. breathe. So it's really natural. And yet we mess with it a little bit. Well, um, the yeah. blocks, like what you've, what you've been describing with the NETs, is also very powerful in that you said that the, I love that you said, you know, you refer to the intelligence of the body and that the body never lies. Mm -hmm. And then you go into how the body stores the energy. So the body is talking to us and letting us know where things are. And what you're describing is a technique and if you facilitate a process where people can then find those blocks within the body by listening to their own body. Exactly. And so it's all coming back to exploration and the inner self and then, you know, ways to release that energy. And then, I mean, as you were describing it, a part of me just went, ah, oh, it's like freedom, joy, yes. <laughs> and also perhaps all that movement in yoga, <laughs> yeah. just, but even just the sense of liberation. Yeah, and empowerment. And it goes back, it's self-realisation, everything. Is, I mean, yoga is life. That's one of the things I didn't talk about. You know, yoga is seen as a physical practice, but yoga is life. And so it helps us to navigate through life. And the whole point is to create congruence. And this is what we talk a lot about in NET. And I talk to my students a lot about this in yoga as well, because it's the same thing. Congruence, you know, we live our lives. And this is, I talked about this in my book, because I remember during my healing journey, I always felt in the beginning of my healing until I, you know, became more expansive and understood this stuff to a deeper level and obviously started studying it as well. But I always felt like there was something wrong with me because mm -hmm. every self-help book that I read, mm -hmm. it was made out to be like they had a miracle healing for the rest of their life. Their life was wonderful. And I was thinking, oh my God, what's wrong with me? Because I'm not, you know, I've been doing this work for four years and I'm still like, ah, so much stuff was coming up and I could definitely see changes. Oh my gosh, for sure. But it's a process. Mm. And so, yeah, so what I kept, and I remember walking to the train station. I was living in Elizabeth Bay and I was walking through the train station in King's Cross. And I just remember walking through the turnstiles and I was thinking, when is my life? When is this miracle going to happen? Is it going to be today? Is my day going to be today? Yeah. But what I came to understand and what we understand through all this healing and all the education that we gain through these studies is that it's learning to be okay with life being good and it's learning to be okay with life when it's inverted commas bad because we're just perceiving it to be bad. We've just gone upon our conditioning. Our hippocampus has gone on a big journey when there's been a bit of a stress. We've gone on that journey through the hippocampus to find a memory so that we know how to act and behave in the given situation because the amygdala has gone off and that's the hippocampus then follows that and goes through and in memory six, how do I handle this? How do I handle this? Oh, bang, here's a memory from six. So, when we're doing all of this work, all kind of healing modalities really are trying to underlyingly do the same thing as bringing us into a space of calm, of being able to trust and being able to handle what's going on. And so we start to understand that life is going to be hell. Life is mm -hmm. going to be challenging. Life is going to throw lemons at us constantly and constantly and constantly. It's not that all of a sudden when we do this healing, our lives are going to be beautiful and wonderful and nothing's going to happen to us that's, again, inverted commas, bad. But what we'll start to see is the value Mm -hmm. in that stuff mm -hmm. and so we will think that life is beautiful because oh my gosh great I think wow another gift for me yes something has shown up now that I need to look at mm -hmm. fantastic mm -hmm. and so then I clear that and I feel this sense of relief sometimes you'll have a session and you just feel like like you said the weight of the world has just come off your shoulders because mm -hmm. it's baggage we're holding mm -hmm. on to kilos and kilos yeah. and kilos of baggage it's like walking down the street with layers with potato bags on us and every time we do these healings, we get to throw another potato out. Oh, thank God, it's starting to get too heavy. And that's it. With the burdens of life can really bring us down. And so by doing this work, it's nothing to be scared of. It's actually something to embrace and be so excited by because it's you getting to throw and toss out what you don't want in your life. And so then we start attracting what we do want in our life. 
because we're letting go and we're seeing things differently. We're no longer attracting, everybody hates me, we're attracting, everybody loves me because we've changed that belief system in ourselves and it's a core belief. All these core beliefs start coming to the surface. Mm. It's amazing. And I'm not saying that it's easy. You know, of course, you have days where you cry and you'll process and sometimes you'll feel weird Mm. for a couple of days, but it's the short term versus the long term. You know, it's looking at the bigger picture. Mm. Yoga, we always say, would you rather suffer 10 seconds or 10 years? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah you're suffering you're feeling like the stiffness the soreness it's uncomfortable the posture feels like you've been held for too long and you want to get out but that bigger picture is but that's going to lead to my life improving and expanding and opening and blossoming i think it's in the buddhist their teachings they often refer to actually they refer to life as suffering mm-hmm. yes yes given from what you're saying you, you inverted commas bad but i would also invert the commas in good life just yeah, well, that's what i was saying yeah, yeah. Life yeah. is, and it, what a in this current situation <laughs> with the world going mad and all these restrictions and rules that are being imposed and what have you. What a time to practice surrender! What mm. a time to and you know this. I know that I don't mean lay on your back and cop it. That's not what surrender is. It's an inner. So you you were touching on that as well. So as you were evolving into your in and your awareness or your expansion and um, things would happen in life but the things that happened in life didn't change but what did change was how you responded from the inside that's what you were saying and then you went ah oh. <laughs> so it's not that bad things are not going to happen inverted commas it's that i'm going to not see them as bad exactly. i'm going to see them as deeper as transformation possibilities as growth as Exactly. Really freedom. And then there was something else you said too, something that led me to thinking about this. We begin to perhaps create or attract experiences then that are even more beyond ourselves, something that serves the highest good, serves the collective. And also when I speak about surrender, that's what I mean. Surrender to, and you touched on this, what I like and what I dislike, what I want and what I don't want. Get rid of all that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Because sometimes your higher self yes. has a way better plan for you yes. than you. Because I yes. sometimes, I, I really do believe that we don't actually have as much control as we yes. think. We're just trying to control. You know, I believe we're on the trajectory of life and walking, if we're on track, if we're on track to where we're meant to be, then mm. life running pretty smoothly and then we start to go over there it's like oh no we're going to create some pain for you so that you get diverted back onto your path and i i really do believe it is about surrender and the more that we meditate and the more that we do all this work to clear the stuff that's blocking us because everything is just blocking us from being in the flow i mean we're always in the flow in some ways but it's the in the flow yeah (laughs) i guess yeah it's the flow the flow that's going to continue us on the path of the least resistance, I guess, in many ways. But in saying that, those resistance points are just such treasures. They're yes. such gold because everything's about self-awareness and self-insight and these moments give us that opportunity to really self-reflect and then work on those things and, and then it just makes us enjoy life more and a better person. And, and as you said, we become more conscious of other people. Mm. because we are quite Mm. (laughs) self-centered you know we do when we've got a lot of baggage we are very self-centered and we don't mean to be it's Mm -hmm. just how we are but the more we open ourselves up and the more we clear these neuro emotional complexes that we all have every single person even the most seemingly enlightened human being has neuro emotional complexes and so the more we do clear them the more we we become selfless and we do have to be selfish at times, obviously, that's part of it. It's selfless, selfish, it's balance. But we do become more open to giving on a universal level. Mm. We stop looking at ourselves and what I need for me and we start looking more into community. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, Bikram used to talk a lot about community and how important the community was. It wasn't about just you coming to your yoga class. It's about the community that you create in that room. You know, you're creating a level of safety. You're creating a level of trust. You're creating a level of connection together that we're all going through this together and we're supporting each other. And this is why in our yoga particularly, we're so adamant that people move together and work together and stay together. And we've got all those seemingly rules that some people go, oh my gosh, they've got so many rules. But that's to bring cohesion 
coherence. And when there's coherence, what happens? We all raise the bar together. We all become so much more powerful. And we start to see that it's not about the big I, 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 I. It's about this collectiveness. I mean, we can just go on and on and on about that, but it really brings us into this whole beautiful interrelated interweb that we're all a part of. Back to you know, yoga, back to unity. Yes, that's right. Back to humanity. Yep. One. We, these are all humanitarian practices, really. And the Buddhists and the Hindus and, you know, all those philosophies, they're all saying the same thing. You know, the Hawaiians and their, all their stuff, it's all saying the same thing. It is. It mm. is. And ultimately we are all in that way also the same. We've just got different things happening. <laughs> right, same, 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 but different story. Yeah. yeah, it reminds me, when I first started to work as an NET practitioner, I was working for my own healer actually in Double Bay and he got me to shadow him for the first month. And because I'd gone through so much trauma in my life and, you know, I've done a lot of work to really change that. And I know that he was always very proud of me for that work. And so I always sort of felt like, oh, yeah, I'm the special one. Like I've healed so much. I had so much trauma and so many problems in my <laughs> life and I healed. Ah, you know, and then when I did the shadowing, because it's different when you're working as a practitioner, you know, you're sort of so focused on what you're doing as the goal point for the client that you don't, you're not looking at that bigger picture. But when I was shadowing and I was hearing everybody's stories for that entire month, 10 stories a day, 20 stories a day, how many times I was in the room with him. Oh my gosh, I remember having this clear insight that, oh, it's not just me. <laughs> everybody has this trauma and everybody has a story, but it's just this different story. Same, same, but just different story, different way of experiencing it. So we're all just coming here. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have that happen to me so that I can experience that that way and you're going to have it that way and you're going to have it that way. So we are all going through the same thing and that brings a lot of compassion. That makes yeah. you realize that, you know, nobody's deliberately, malevolently trying to hurt you. Yes. It's that we're all just coping with our own stuff and trying to get by. So, yeah, the more we all, we all do our own job and our own work and point the finger inwards instead of outwards, we will start to create this deeper compassion for everybody else in the world. Which is really what's needed. And it's even more highlighted at this given time. At this time. And there's been a lot of pointing fingers from all sides, you know. Yes. You're wrong, yes. you're wrong, you're wrong. Yes. And it's actually creating us to be more dense as human beings. It's keeping us stuck yeah. rather than believing that, well, there's actually more beyond this physical realm that we're all looking and focusing at. There is some whole world beyond that. And that might sound like I'm going down the rabbit hole a bit, but, you know, there is a veil. There's a veil that's like, okay, this is the physical plane of, work, of earth. But when we do these healings and we start to experience these different vibrations and these different levels of ourselves, mm. you know, visions and insights mm. and all of that, that shows us how much potential we have. It's interesting, Candace Pert talks in her book, Molecules of Emotion, she talks about how we're only 1% physical matter mm -hmm. and we're 99% energy. And so most of us are focusing and living our lives based on that 1% yeah. of physical matter. So it's really quite eye-opening. Wow, there is so much potential for us to explore and go beyond what we're seeing. Yeah. What we're seeing is just a perceived reality. Hmm. Well, our eternal selves are no, zero physical. <laughs> well, well, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, Multi-dimensional. Yeah, exactly. So, yes, it is. And, and this, just this compassion that is so necessary all the time and so much so today is lovely to bring up and yeah. it is very healing and connecting. And really, if I, when I think of compassion, it's something I want to be and to give, but it's really very much also something I want to, I want other people to look at me yeah. compassionately when I mess up, which I often do. Yeah. When I get into something that's a little unconscious or what have you, that this, what I really need is compassion. I try to reverse that and so when I see someone doing something that my mind might say, oh, gosh, that's bad or gosh, that's wrong, my heart just says compassion. Yeah. It, it's all the same. So let's... Yeah, and we all fall down at times and get it wrong again and <laughs> go into judgment and go into all those other emotions. But, yeah, it's a continuing journey, isn't it? Wish I could say I was enlightened. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> wish, wish I could... Yeah. You wouldn't be here on this earth if you were, I think. It wouldn't be here. <laughs> maybe, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, meditation. Meditation. 
I noticed somewhere along the line that you're creating a meditation series. We haven't even talked about meditation. We've talked about emotion and physical us postures a little. Um, yeah, tell me what sort of meditation series are you creating and how, how does this work for you in your life? Okay, so I meditate every day and more so probably in the last few years. There was a couple of years where I just got really busy and when I was doing yoga and having my quick savasana at the end of it, I wasn't really meditating and made an, the impact of my life was very evident for me. So there's so many different forms of meditation. I do a few. So I'm trained in quantum energetics, so I do a, a meditation that way as well. I do vary my meditation. I don't always do the same one. That's just what works for me. Mm -hmm. I go through periods. And so I guess it's because I'm trained in so many different things and I explore, you know, the quantum meditation is a lot more energy, sort of earth energy healing stuff with your hands. So I like to do that from time to time. But then I also love the Shatali breathing that mm. we learned as initiation. It's a Kriya yoga breathing. Mm. And so you're focusing on the breath going in and out and you're creating a sort of sound like car and key. And wow. so by focusing on that, I like to do a bit more active meditation. I find that that's a bit more beneficial for me. Mm. We all do better with different stuff. Mm. And with the Shatali breathing, you're focusing on lengthening the breath and trying to get it as smooth and long and slow as possible. So that gives your mind such a focal point. You know, when you're meditating, meditation is just focus without judgment. Mm. And it's keeping your, your mind on a focal point in witnessing and observing what's going on at the same time. You know, you'll feel the thoughts come in. But again, you're not trying to attach to the thoughts. You're just letting them come and go, come and go. So there's different various ways of how to focus. Some people like to look at a candle and do candle gazing. Mm -hmm. Some people like to just bring their attention to their third eye mm -hmm. and just focus. You know, in Kriya Yoga, they often say, you know, mm -hmm great creator reveal thyself reveal thyself so that's a way of meditating mm. other times people prefer to do a guided meditation and so i am doing a bit of guided meditation but very basic stuff so guiding them of how to meditate and i'm going to be doing a series of, of different meditations for them to explore because i really do believe that you'll connect with a couple of them more than in others and so when you find one that works for you then you're more likely to stick to it so I'm going to do a bit of a series. Absolutely. So Shatali breathing, is that something you teach in your meditation series? Is it something you're going to be? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to be. Lovely. I'd yeah. love to. Yeah. Love to yeah. More about yeah. That. And it's then beautiful. you touched on a couple of meditation gems. There was that one, the Shatali breathing. So that's nice to know. We can learn that through your series. What about the third eye focus, great creator, reveal thyself, the Kriya meditation. Are you working with that one as well? Yeah, I'm going to teach. Wow. There's about 13 that I'm going to teach. Okay. So there'll be a course over a period of 13 weeks. And then, so you'll learn a new meditation each week and then you will then find which one works for yes, you. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, in my own experience of meditation, I find a few. And as you described, I guess, and then I just go with what flows in that day, I guess. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. That's right. And sometimes my mind is so active, I actually need to put on a guided meditation yeah else yeah i'm like my mind is just not settling but sometimes if you stick with it sometimes i find okay i'll just keep sticking with it and that's part of the process i mean you actually are meditating yes. when you're observing that your mind's all over the place well that is meditation it is. it's it is. not always going to be you know rainbows and, and butterflies you know <laughs> and <laughs> Which can be. sometimes you meditate and you're just like wow like you're just so yeah. you're yeah. so many visions and insights are coming in and other times it's just the struggle to sit there you know yes, yes. and it's part of that process of just sticking it out no matter what yeah, and just sitting. Yeah. yeah, but that's where it's good to have some tools of different meditations because sometimes that yes, one will work that's more right. effectively. And that's right, and that's basically exactly yeah the point I was also getting at, and also a cushion. <laughs> I have this cushion, and I oh yes, sometimes it just calls me, and like I could be in whatever state I'm in, and the cushion is just saying sit on me, sit, on. and then <laughs> when I sit on that cushion, and it can be early in the morning, or it could be you know I don't have to set any. I might do a certain amount each day, or maybe more, maybe a bit less. Yeah. But that cushion will call me yeah. and well that's conditioning right <laughs> sit that's why it's beautiful and it should create a little sacred space like I have a beautiful space I don't have a really large apartment but I have a little space and I have because I do Buddhist chanting as well and so I have my gahonzen which is a big box that we chant to that has like Hindi and Japanese Sanskrit on it and, and Japanese writing on it. So I sometimes sit in front of that when I meditate because it just creates this ambient place and, and it becomes a conditioned place. At the moment you walk in, ah, 
you know, I remember years ago when I used to massage and my clients would come, like had been coming for quite a while. And I remember one of them walking in, she goes, you know, the moment I step foot into your room, I feel my whole body just go like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's because you've conditioned now this room is associated with relaxation, with associated with opening freedom. So -hmm. that's what happens even when you're meditating, you've got your little cushion and that your body associates with that. Oh oh yeah, this means relax. And so it's beautiful because you Mm -hmm. can start already making changes before you've even sat down and closed your eyes, you know. It's little yeah. rituals and routines are just so valuable. You mentioned that before you started practicing meditation, sort of as a daily discipline, you said something about that you were really busy. And then I thought, as you said that, were you busy or was your mind busy? Oh, it was a bit of both. A bit of both. Because I, I both. often wonder when to say that there's no time to meditate is kind of when I, that's when I think that's when you really must Oh, down. that is when you really must, yes. And that's when I wasn't. I mean, I was doing yeah. my yoga and I was yeah. doing a lot of yoga. Yeah. But at the time I was studying, I was teaching full-time, studying full-time, trying to fit everything in and right. literally it was like wake up at, you know, 4.45, come mm-hmm. home sometimes at 10 o'clock mm-hmm. at night and then I'm just smashed and I go to bed. Or other times I had to come home and study and do my assignments till one in the morning. So, you know, I'm not trying to make excuses because really we've got to find the time, even if it's five minutes. Yes. And that's what made me go, you've got to get back to that, Rowena, you know. Yeah. And I got slack. And you know what made me go back? I enrolled in a meditation course yeah. so that I had to go and I had no out. And that just set me back on track. So I did it. Yeah, I just did another a 10 week, a 12 week course. Fantastic. <laughs> so Fantastic. Just, yeah. Every Thursday now from 12 till 2, I am in meditation. meditation. Mm-hmm. And so that just brought back the routine. I just needed yeah. to the routine. Like you said, I just had to find, yeah. find the time. Because you're yeah. right, it's never we're too busy. We just tell ourselves we're too busy. It's the mind. That's what I said. It's the mind because uh, you know even yeah. people can go on a holiday and still keep themselves so busy. Yeah, and, yeah. And they're away from the work and the daily routines, yeah. but that busyness really comes from yeah. the mind. Yeah. And I think sometimes that busyness comes to distract us because when yeah. we're too busy, what happens? We're running around, we're chickens, you know, running around with our heads cut off, and there's no time for us to have to go within. There's no time to have to sit. Because when we're busy and running around, we don't often have time to feel. And so it can be quite a, distraction. I guess, a protective me- mechanism so that, we, yeah, a distraction so that we don't have to feel. And when we're sitting in meditation, what happens? Whoop, all the stuff comes up that we've been trying to suppress. So that can sometimes be a reason why people are going, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, or making themselves busy making so themselves. they don't have to sit, you know. That's right. That's a- <laughs> Meditation is just beautiful and powerful and I love the sound of what you're creating. And I want to ask you about Lionheart. You actually already, you said a little bit back when we were talking about emotions that you roared like a lion when you released these emotions, which made me think, I'm going to ask you, what does having a lion heart mean to you? (laughs) Wow, what a question. Okay, so I think lion heart is the combination between being courageous and strong and warrior-like but soft and beautiful and in your heart. There's a quote that I put on a yoga hostel once. It just came into my mind. Courage doesn't always roar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and we often think that we have to be the big warrior out there going, rah, you know, and fighting for things. But it's that mm-hmm. internal when we go inside, every solution's there. When we're feeling angry, the solution is going back inside to the breath. And when we're feeling sad, the solution is going back inside. I think that, yeah, it's finding that, that strength from within without having to be. But the lion is just such a, a lion. I remember when I was doing performing, we were performing in the Adelaide Fringe Festival and we're actually in the Adelaide Zoo and the lion, we were right near the lion's cage And we spent a lot of time listening to the lions and being near those lions and they're just so majestic. They're powerful. They're Mm. so powerful. And, yeah, they roar, but they're also just so poised and so still. And Mm. so I think it's that combination of both. It is. That's the beauty. It's that, yeah, Mm. that's what it means to me. (laughs) It's this intrinsic self-value. They own it. Yes. As a human being myself, I don't want to speak on behalf of others, but remember we touched on we all feel the same insecurities and and things like this. It's kind of like when I look at a lion, it's that intrinsic sense of self-value and I go, yeah, well, (laughs) that's a teacher for me. Mm. That's beautiful. Now, we we, um, 
food is just another wonderful, amazing. I mean, your book <laughs> a lot of content, but the recipes and the food in there is is just phenomenal. So creative. Did you really? Like, <laughs> I'm thinking you must just have such a passion for food to be so creative with it. And you're big on plant based, raw. Just give me a, a you know a little bit of a rundown on food. The joy of real food. The joy of real food. Well, we know that being healthy is important. We all know that. Even the person eating junk food knows deep down that really this is doing harm to my body. And we're, you know, chemicals, and we understand that chemicals create food in labs deliberately to make you addicted to that food so you keep eating it. There's big problems going on. And we know that food affects mood and all of that. So I guess I'm passionate in that way. But I think the exciting thing for me was that because I had an eating disorder and, you know, I was emotionally, I was starving and binging and I was shoving junk food into me every time I felt emotions, mm. instead of dealing with the emotions and then starving myself. So I had a very poor relationship with food, very poor relationship. And so when I started to study nutrition and I always had a passion for cooking back, like when I was a child, my stepfather was a really amazing cook. And very inspirational cook. Like he'd look at a recipe and he would just put the recipe aside and then make it himself. Whereas my mum was always like, follow the recipe. And so I watched this creative flair and I think that really inspired me a lot. And then when I first started healing my life, there was barely any vegans. Mm -hmm. There was barely any, any even really amazing, fun, healthy food out there. It was very hard to find cookbooks or anything great to eat. And so I actually just started to try to create my own recipes, you know, and just, okay, well, I don't want to eat dairy and I don't want to eat this and I don't want to eat that. I want to want to feel good in my body. And so I just started making stuff up. And then I had read Fit for Life by Marilyn. Oh, you got my book. I had read Fit for Life by Marilyn and Harvey Diamond. And that had also inspired mm -hmm. me in many ways. And it's interesting because a lot of those preconceived concepts back then that they were talking about now have become science, you know, whereas mm -hmm. before it was like, oh, what's this that they're talking about? Mm -hmm. And so I sort of got inspired by them and their recipes and then just various different things. And then I, after I finished my nutrition study, my naturopathic and nutrition studies, I actually went and studied plant-based cooking mm. with Matthew Kenny. And he is one of the most innovative, he's a celebrity chef in the States, and he's one of the most innovative chefs out there. You know, it's all about creativity. And I really sort of started to feel that if you create creative dishes, people will eat healthy food. Yes. People want to eat disgusting lasagna filled with, you know, not so great mm. stuff. But if you can create a beautiful, healthy lasagna that's so similar in flavors and textures and we are very texturally based you know and we're also emotionally based food and emotions go hand in hand so it's creating those same flavors and even the same smells of things that trigger us from childhood or beautiful memories like people love bread and wheat and all that because often the times it relates us to our grandmothers and times of being nurtured and Doreen Virtue's work looks into this her old work looks into a lot of the associations between food and emotions and um yeah, so I just decided that, okay, well, I'm going to start creating all this amazing food that tastes fantastic and that inspires people to want to eat well. Yeah. And it just went from there. <laughs> yeah. And I just love it. And I get these, like, I'll be lying in Savasana in yoga and all of a sudden I'll have this recipe pop in. Oh, my God, go home and create this recipe. Oh. So I'll go home and... And you got yeah. these tips and I love it. One of the tips you said is just do a juice, just juice for one day every month. That's it. And it gives your digestion a rest. And that is, it's so true. Yep. It's so true. And then yep. you have this other tip about routine and yes. about how important it is. And I'm thinking this might come from some Ayurvedic training as yeah, well. Yeah, very much Ayurveda. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, about eating at the same time of the day. So the body knows when it's going to do its work and when it's going to rest and everything just works better. And it just makes yeah. so, it's really yeah. like being in tune into the yeah. body. Yeah, yeah. Human beings work much better when there is routine. Yeah, we, so we do animals. Of, so yeah, do animals. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, you're right. They get up the same day. They, mm. You know, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, routines well, guess, are really powerful. It's one of the first things we do with people when they are, you know, suffering with anxiety and stress is, you know, and in Ayurveda, obviously, you know, when someone's vitagenic, they've got a lot of air and ether in their body. So they're going to be much more hypervigilant. They're going to be more stressful. There's going to be more insomnia. There's going to be more the mind just cheetah chatters the whole time so routine is one of the things that helps to 
really stabilize that and help to create that less erraticness because someone that's very vada is always going to be erratic mm. you know and, and i am very vada i'm vada pita i'm vada on the cusp of both so i can go in out of balance like, yeah. either. from yeah. the little i know about ayurveda and if i were to i would have pinned you as pita because of your exuberance and passion and yeah yeah i'm, I'm right on the cusp i'm actually equal vada pita and then kaffas down the line but that's what, because of that i can go off in either way and because of my conditioning Mm. my psychological stuff is very pitta. I mean, sorry, very, very vada. Yeah. So mm. I can get really hypervigilant. So routines are really important and it's challenging, you know, because my life is not, is not routined. I have different mm. <laughs> classes, different clients, it's all different. Mm. So yeah, routine has um, definitely, you know, trying to create routine within the routine has been very much a big help for my life. I try to create routine and yeah, it does help a lot with people with anxiety is routine, mm. but everyone needs it really to some degree you know i wanted to tell you something quickly when i first started doing bikram yeah um, i did notice a couple of i guess you could say sore spots i had an injury on my knee that had happened so many years ago when i was water skiing and it kind of resurfaced in one of the postures in particular i, I can't recall the name but and i noticed it a little bit of pain and then there was a sciatica i was having on and off problems with sciatica and then i did and this was sort of just, a, I did a fast, a juice fast, water fast, very deep detox. And then after having done that, I ate raw. I decided, I went on a raw, just ate raw. And it wasn't until recently that I noticed that ever <laughs> since I had done that, there was no more pain in Bikram. Yeah, so, that, was, yeah. Anti-inflammatory. So, yeah, there's more and more science, I guess, showing how fasting and even juicing and it can really help in so many different ways because you, you're trying to eliminate elimination and things like that, you know. And, of course, the liver plays such a huge role as well. You know, the liver, it's the chief cleansing organ of the body. So the more it's, again, everything, it's elimination. So if you can improve your elimination pathways, it's what's happening when we're, when we're freeing up the digestive system where it doesn't have to do all the work that it has to do constantly. And digestion takes up more energy than anything. So we're freeing up the digestive system. We're helping the kidneys. We're helping the skin. We're, you know, through sweating as well, of course. But, you know, when you're detoxing the body, obviously detox is a very normal thing that the body does every day as i said mm. the liver is the cleansing organ and basically what's happening within the liver is that it's trying to there's two phases and the overall process is that liver is trying to create everything to become water soluble mm. in order to be excreted from the body so you've got hormones that are being excreted you've got viruses bacteria fungi you've got chemicals from foods that you've eaten the body's also if you understand the biochemistry of our body it's also creating its own metabolites because as the biochemical process is taking place in the body, there's waste products from that. And then we've, you know, we've got the antioxidants and all things like that. So, and free radical damage and all of these things that's happening in the body. And then the liver's got to contend with all of that. And then if we've got stress, so one of the biggest things is the cortisol levels. Yeah. So when we've got excess cortisol, the liver actually is unable to work to yeah. its optimum level. And so when you're doing a detox, and you're cleansing and you're slowing down the digestion and the, the offset, you know, digestion's in the centre and then you've got this offset everywhere else in all the other systems of the body, it makes so much sense and the system starts working better. The liver's able to speed up again instead of slowing down. Often if it gets slowed down, then, of course, liver phase two hits and then you're not able to expel stuff. And this is when we see oestrogen problems. This is when we see, you know, build-up of oestrogen and, and cancers and breast cancers and even like heavy periods for women and sore breasts and stuff, you know, this all the estrogen clearance because it's not able to clear mm. properly from the liver. So, of course, then, of course, our inflammation reduces, you know, we've got better processes going on with our antioxidant supports mm. and, you know, so it makes sense that pain just starts to dissipate. <laughs> mm. It's pretty powerful. The body is this incredible mm. innate system that, you know, Louise Hayes to say it all the time, you can go to sleep and not even have to think about breathing. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was a really powerful thing she said to me because it's that's the autonomic system of our body. It will function. It will keep on functioning for us. And so when we learn how to facilitate and respect it mm. like a temple that it is and feed it beautiful nourishing foods and do exercise that helps our lymphatic system to move because it has to move or we get sluggish and fluid retention and things, then 
we're able to function better. And when we're functioning better, what happens? We feel better in our body and then we feel happier and then we start treating other people better. And, you know, and I guess that's probably my biggest message is that that's the humanitarian side of my message, I guess. So, yeah, when we take care of ourselves, we feel good and everything functions well. And then we function better together as a society and as a world. And that's permaculture there. <laughs> that's, a, that's a theory of permaculture as well. <laughs> Thank you for spending your precious time listening to this podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed. You can find some helpful links related to the topics we have discussed, download some freebies and join our Lionheart community by visiting our website, lionheartworkshops.com. To view this specific podcast blog, click on podcast at the main menu. Please also share this with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so that these ideas can continue to spread. Those pretty little stars help others to find us. The Lionheart Podcast and Lionheart Online Workshops is an online platform and community designed to enhance your health, natural and spiritual well-being. Until next time, please think about how you will embody your Lionheart and reach your highest potential as the amazing human being that you are.